with uh, Singapore Social Economic uh, Development and, uh, and high standards now in, in sanitation and hygiene. Um, I think one of the major achievements um, and milestones for Singapore has been the rapid decline in food and waterborne diseases. Um, diseases such as cholera, um, typhoid fever, enteric fevers like typhoid para, typhoid, hepatitis A, we hardly ever see any of those. If we do see, then they're usually imported. And then also in addition, um, with the now very high vaccine coverage rates that Singapore has achieved over the past decades and really uh, implementing all the WHO recommended um, EPI vaccines, um, we've now also seen a, a massive decline, almost el elimination of vaccine preventable diseases such as um, polio, uh, measles, tetanus, etc. Um, hepatitis B is a uh, still a big problem in, in Asia and, and in Singapore. And, uh, and Singapore introduced hepatitis B vaccine in 1987, and now we also see a massive decline in the in, in hepatitis B infections in that age group. Um, there's also TB, and for TB we have a vaccine called BCG. Unfortunately, BCG is a relatively bad or ineffective vaccine. Hence, uh, Singapore remains a um, country with, with moderate uh, incidence of, of tuberculosis. Um, but also remember that what we see today in TB cases actually mirrors um, uh, the exposure about you know, decades ago. There are many lessons to be learned and that we have learned already from the 2003 SARS outbreak and the 2009 H1N1 outbreak. <clears throat> uh, I think one lesson is, is that uh, Singapore will always, is and will always be vulnerable to, to the importations of, um, of, of infectious diseases uh, being such a travel hub. And two, I think we've learned um, that it's very important to have systems in place that early recognize such uh, cases, isolate them, and then rapidly scale up hospital-based infection control measures. Having well, very detailed um, pandemic preparedness plans in place is very important, and Singapore has established such, such plans. And in addition, we also do simulation exercises to keep our doctors and nurses on the feet. Um, I think what we need to learn is that, that, that uh, we, we need to be prepared um, for more to come. Singapore has managed really to have an exemplary uh, dengue vector control program. It's implemented all the WHO uh, recommendations that include um, environmental management, um, active detection of breeding sites, um, reactive insecticidal fogging, public health education, community participation, georeferenced um, entomological surveillance, as well as very good clinical surveillance. Uh, so dengue is a notifiable disease and we've been able to track and monitor the disease over the past decades. Um, now, despite such a good vector control program, that was really started in 1970s and led to a decrease in, 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 in vector density and also in cases initially. In the 1990s, dengue researched. And so we had a major outbreak in 2005 and it comes in, in increasing magnitude and frequency and, and I think the historically largest peaks or outbreaks were in the year, years 2013 and, and 14. So then the question is why do we have research of dengue despite a good vector control program for which the Singapore government does spend a, a lot of money. Um, I, I think, ironically, po possibly um, the success of the vector control program is also one of the reasons for the resurgence because with a good program you will have reduced force of infection, hence a lowered herd immunity with a with more susceptible population. So this could be one reason. But I think we need to look at other reasons as well. Um, so Singapore has seen a population growth, has, has basically seen doubling of its population of the, over the past decades. Uh, it has also seen a, made, uh, a minor uh, climate change with an increase of the mean temperature of two, by about one to two, two degrees over the past decades. 
And Singapore is also a travel hub with, and receives a constant influx of new dengue virus serotypes and, and, and genotypes that can trigger new outbreaks. So all these factors probably play together. Um, maybe just out of, um, of interest, I would like to share a study, a mathematical modeling study that we just recently uh, published, where we looked at the putative drivers for dengue in Singapore. So we looked at um, population growth, climate change, and incoming travel. And uh, interestingly, what we found using Poisson regression models was that the dengue resurgence is, is by 85% attributable to population growth. And population growth is also biologically a plausible explanation given the fact that Aedes vectors you know, can take various blood meals. Uh, so if people are very close together, we can take one blood meal within one go, basically, and thereby, uh, thereby transmitting the disease easily. So I think, I think we need to take population growth and density of, of po and population density serious uh, when we do want to tackle um, the dengue. So. so what can we do about dengue? Or what else do you think we can do about dengue? Um, so we need to remain open-minded, um, also open towards novel uh, strategies, we may need to be bold and courageous and take steps that maybe other countries have not yet done. And I'm mainly thinking of two interventions. One is, um, is, a, is a novel method for vector control uh, based on uh, Bombachia. Um, it's a new method uh, developed by, by Australian researchers. It still uh, has not been rolled out. And so, so uh, it, Singapore may be one place where we could investigate this at, at a larger scale. I think more. Um, um, I think more reliable is, is the is, is another issue is is the strategy using vaccines. I think for any disease that is vector borne, vector borne or has an animal reservoir, etc. I think vaccines can both is the only strategy that is viable and sustainable over the long term. Uh, and indeed, there's a there's a robust pipeline of several dengue vaccine candidates, and one vaccine candidate has uh, recently completed phase three efficacy trials and has now been submitted for licensure. Now this vaccine unfortunately does not offer 100% uh, protection. The efficacy is around 60%. Um, so, um, and there have also been some, some safety issues. So with a careful, well thought through approach I think we should um, at least attempt to roll this vaccine out, uh, but it's never a single approach with an efficacy that is not complete. So combine it with, a, with an improved vector control strategy, it may have an impact on reducing dengue in Singapore. That's great. I think the real current threat is MERS. Obviously, H7 and 9, H5 and 1, or other avian influenza viruses continue to be a potential threat. But MERS is the current threat. Um, there are still ongoing um, MERS outbreaks and cases in the Middle East, which means that at any time, any day, a traveler could import uh, MERS coronavirus into Singapore. South Korea is an example how the importation of just one of the virus by just one single traveler uh, led to a major outbreak. Um, and as um, uh, Prime Minister Lee um, said, it's not a question of if, but when. So we should all be prepared for, for MERS to be introduced at any time. Now, um, fortunately, we, uh, we have learned very important lessons from the 2003 um, SARS outbreak. And I think we are much better positioned now to, to, to face such an, uh, a new outbreak. We do have a system in place uh, to recognize such cases, identify them, isolate them, do contact tracing, and also rapidly scale up hospital-based infection control measures. We have specialized ambulances to take care of such patients. We have laboratories that are accredited and set up 
to, um, to, to handle specimens with unknown or with potentially dangerous infectious uh, pathogens. Um, we do regular simulation exercises so that to keep our doctors and nurses on their feet to be prepared. And, um, and the government has set up a, a surveillance response um, uh, system that is a color-coded uh, system to, um, to, to effectively increase um, also the communication between the government and the public to reduce the potential public health impact of such an, of such an introduction of a new pathogen. On a, on a personal level, because of my, my past, my, my, my main focus on travel med medicine and travel related vaccine preventable diseases, um, I, I would like to see um, a strengthened focus on research on travel related diseases, um, to see, to model and to quantify the risk of importation via, via travelers. And there are now very good um, systems in place where we can use. Um, model around air, flight data, air passenger data, etc. Um, secondly, um, with, the, uh, with the upcoming National Center for Infectious Diseases, NCID, I think uh, there's a lot of potential to bring the infectious disease community together um, and, um, and to enhance more collaboration, to also enhance nationwide surveillance systems that are currently often clustered within a within a um, um, hospital setting. Um, so to overcome those barriers, I think such a national approach would be better. Um, I also hope to see more research funding going into infectious diseases, not only in terms of outbreak preparedness, uh, public health, but also into basic science. And, um, and my biggest hope and, uh, and, and maybe long-term future um, aspiration would be that we would have, uh, we would um, maybe be also the first in rolling out new vaccines, for example, the Dengue vaccine, that we would be leading in kind of vaccine trials, and that we would um, attract uh, more companies with a, with a vaccine focus.